Today we're here to talk about deer fencing. Um, why are we talking about deer fencing when I hear when the Indians were running around here, there were four deer per square mile. Uh, we, I, by the way, I have no wildlife background other than I used to hunt. And a long time ago, Rutgers decided that uh, I would get involved with wildlife management, which is fine, I enjoyed it. And we got involved with some deer surveys. The first thing we found out was that there's an awful lot of deer in this particular area. So we did a helicopter winter survey in March before the fawns were born. We did 25,000 acres with infrared, and we found 327 deer per square mile. When the Indians were here, there were about four. Now, we went to the worst area. This was Delaware Township. There was a lot of wildlife habitat. People were feeding deer. And um, we attempted to work with USDA Wildlife Services Division of Fish and Game and have uh, sharpshooters come in to reduce the deer herd, and that didn't work so well. A lot of opposition. Um, there's a lot of emotions. Uh, we worked with repellents. They can work, they don't work. And on down the line, what happens, we find out that deer fencing is the least controversial uh, effective tool to prevent deer uh, from damaging, in this case, pretty much high value crops. So deer fencing became a selection of choice rather than reducing the deer herd. Um, the deer herd around here is probably as greater, greater than it was. Again, I'm not a wildlife biologist, but there's a lot of deer. Um, so fencing, uh, the first fencing programs we got involved with were the Department of Ag, and you may have been involved in that. There was one and a half million feet of fencing distributed to farmers in New Jersey in two programs. And um, we have Kenco fencing here today. Lacey and Haas are in the back. They're gonna do a demonstration later out on the farm, but um, we're gonna go through the specs of the different fences. But in any event, uh, this fencing, we did surveys and it was very effective. We know fencing properly installed and maintained is very effective. Now, it's expensive. We all know that. And there's this program today you're taking advantage of, which is great. And um, since you can't really control the deer, fencing is your option. However, um, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about some other things we did um, a number of years back, and just uh, you might find them interesting. And um, anybody here have orchards, uh, nursery stock? Um, so we happen to have hybrid willows. They're, they're easy to grow. And um, basically, you cut a branch off, stick it in a bucket of water at roots, and you plant it. And what we found out was that on, on our farm, we had a lot of deer, and we found out that hybrid willows were preferred by, by the bucks to, for buck rubs, and they browsed them very heavily. Um, so what we did, we did a little study, and we, put, uh, we went out to areas where it had a high deer population. We went during the, uh, prior to the rut, and we put these hybrid willows out, um, and we looked at whether deer preferred browsing and uh, Buck and rubbing them for uh, as their buck rubs rather than apple trees or peach trees. We also looked at hot tape, uh, inexpensive electrical tape for reducing deer damage, and we looked at portable electric fencing. So um, not everything necessarily needs to be a high tensile woven wire fence. Uh, when we looked at the hybrid willows, and again, this is not really heavy duty research, but it, it gives you some indications. Um, we went and we put a, peach, uh, a couple peach trees, a couple apple trees, and a couple willow trees in about a 10 foot by 15 foot area in different locations and where there was deer pressure, no fencing. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the line, this is the willows, this is the apple and the peaches, you can see the preference for uh, the willows in terms of buck rubs and browsing. So we would call that like a trap crop. So maybe combined with some other deer deterrent, you might want to plant some willows on the outside of the area to keep deer browsing uh, these trees rather than your expensive nursery stock or your orchard. So the next slide. Um, hot tape, I'm going to show you a picture of what that is. We say hot tape or hot rope. Uh, what we found out is if you put two single strands um, about six to ten feet apart, about 42 inches up, and you electrify them, and you put them around smaller acreages, like uh, one or two acres of high-value crops, uh, we actually did some observations, and the deer were very reluctant to get involved with the depth perception of the two rows of hot tape or hot rope. 
And uh, you can see with pumpkins, this happened to be with pumpkins, you can see uh, inside and outside during the season, the damage to pumpkins was uh, significantly reduced at two locations. A very inexpensive way. And again, you can try it out, it might work in your location. And in particular, we also found out that we planted soybeans. We called soybeans M&Ms for deer. They're easy to grow and expensive. And we put like a quarter of an acre of soybeans outside of the pumpkin area between the woodlot and the pumpkin field. We kept reseeding the soybeans, just spinning them on and disking them in. And that was holding the deer away from our high value crops. So this was a combined effort of the hot tape or hot rope with a trap crop. And uh, portable electric fencing, we have some at the farm. We've used it uh, for damage on strawberries. We had foxes coming into strawberries and it was pretty effective. Um, so this is the uh, last slide and you can see this is what we call a hot tape or hot rope. This is not as far apart as we would like it, maybe closer to eight to 10 feet, two rows. Uh, around an acre or so of pumpkins or high value crops, especially if you just have a temporary situation, you don't want to put up high tensile woven <clears throat> wire fence. And this is a picture of the, of the uh, netting, electrified netting, and it comes in different heights and uh, it's been effective for both small mammals. Uh, groundhogs don't seem to be concerned about electric. They just kind of forge through it, but uh, we've had foxes and some other, foxes will come in and dig up the plastic on strawberries, do a lot of damage, and we've been able to re keep the foxes out with that type of netting. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I thought I'd bring it up as um, not everything has to be high tensile woven wire fence. And um, we did an evaluation of the fencing that was given out a while back, the million and a half feet of fencing. And this is some information. 9% of the self-installed fences were contractor quality installed. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about the quality of installation. Um, obviously, if you do a nice install and everything is done right, the maintenance is lower and it's more effective. You can see a lot of issues with self-installed fence. Some people did a really nice job and others uh, not so good. We're going to talk about it later out in the field. The H braces on the corner posts, 17% of them. I'm not going to go through all this information, but um, there is certainly a lot of uh, data that suggests strongly that you need to install your fence properly uh, to get it to work well. Um, there was one area where the fences were sagged. There were ditches. The deer, were able, deer will go under a fence rather uh, effectively if they're given a chance. And so what I'm trying to say here is that Today, uh, with Kenco fencing here, just demonstrating how to properly install a fence, it's going to be very important for you to uh, pay attention and decide if you want to do it yourself, if you want to do part of it yourself, and have part of it uh, installed professionally. And of course, cost is always a big factor. So um, that'll be your decision to decide uh, what's your best option. Thank you. But real quickly, I only take about 10 minutes. I'm going to talk about how this program came to be where we're going with it, but most importantly, what you need to do to get reimbursed. So with that in mind, let me roll through these slides here. We all know that the problem here, uh, I've been here five and a half years, came from Wisconsin before that, uh, New Hampshire before that, and Virginia before that, and never did I have seen deer densities that exceed 300 per square mile. Uh, so what are we gonna do about it? So. Here, uh, John was uh, not embarrassed you, but you're, you said you came into the wildlife business haphazardly, but you've done a lot of great research with David Drake. This is the most recent data we have from 2000 that shows you the majority of uh, crop loss in New Jersey attributed to white-tailed deer. And this is 2000, and the cost per acre and, uh, and the crop loss average per acre is $1,253. So you can imagine what it is in 2017. And John, some of your maps from that study, again, this is 20 year old data, but the majority of farmers, and these are deer management zones from DEP, report uh, crop losses are intolerable. Now, if you overlay this map with a map produced by University of Minnesota uh, about 10 years ago, you can see the parallels here, kind of an S, 
the western part of the state with very high deer densities that exceed 45 per square mile. For comparison, the carrying capacity is about 15 deer per square mile. So you can see the majority of the state is uh, under high deer pressure. Now, uh, as John mentioned, the Department of Agriculture had its own program back in the day, which some of you all may have participated in. Just to be clear, the SADC is in but not of the Department of Ag. It's, we're a separate agency. So their deer program is not the same as our deer program. One of the questions was, how come this program is only limited to preserve farms? I'm going to get into that. NJDA was available for all farms. So ours is for preserve farms only. So everybody in this room is on a preserve farm. And I'll explain how we found the funding for that. So I don't know if you all know about this Preserve New Jersey Act that was passed in 2016. This is just background on why you're sitting in this room. <laughs> uh, we never had dedicated funding for farmland preservation. It came from bond issuances over the years. That's how most states fund their farmland preservation. There was some, some leadership in the legislature and eventually the governor signed this, this uh, act, uh, which basically a portion of the corporate business tax collected in New Jersey now gets dedicated to farmland preservation and also green acres, blue acres, historic preservation. Up to 3% of that money coming into farmland preservation is going to be used for programs just like this. In other words, don't throw all the money into acquisition, reserve some of it for taking care of the land that we acquired an easement over. So that 3% is what we went to the legislature with several months ago. And unfortunately, we still don't have an answer on that money, so you all can't start building fence till we get that approval, but we're, I think we're almost there. So we requested the, th the full 3% that you see here from this corporate business tax for stewardship. And the way we're defining stewardship is, of course, deer fencing, which we're here to talk to you about, soil and water grants, which is a long-standing uh, program for not only eight year, but permanently preserved farms that Dave Clapp after me is going to talk about. So ultimately we have almost one and a half million for taking care of these farms that have been preserved. The way I like to think of it is you've been preserved, but we haven't forgotten about you. Some of these successive generations of preserved farm owners, the, the check's gone, it's been spent, but we haven't forgotten about you. That's kind of the message here with this stewardship money. So hopefully here in August we'll hear something and then we can give you a letter that says, yes, we have the funding, but we don't want to wait around till we got the money before we put together this presentation today and the training. We want to get everything up and running and then we get the money, we can, you guys can go ahead and commence construction. Uh, real quick, I don't want to bore you with all the legislative history, but the reason why I heard, I heard some uh, dialogue this morning about the $200 an acre, we'll get that in a minute, it's confusing. The reason why not everybody that applied was funded is because we had to retrofit old regulations in order to get this money up and running. If we want to have the absolute perfect deer fencing program, it would take years to develop the regulations. So rather than do that, we retrofit this, uh, this old regulation from 2002, which I don't know if you all even remember this. It's called the Farmland Stewardship Program. It's kind of ag viability grants, if you will. And one of the things that we, could, that we funded under those regs was fencing. So what we did is through policy, take this legislative authority or regulatory authority and go ahead and just get the money out. So that's why it seems a little, uh, again, the numbers are what they are, which I'll get to in the next slide. Anyway, long story short, some of that relic regulatory language, you have to be an owner operator, you can't be a tenant. Uh, you gotta be actively engaged in the farm. Uh, those are all things that precluded some people from applying. Same here, you have to be permanently preserved. That was one of our major questions. Why not, why not non-preserved farms? That's just the nature of this regulatory relic here. Anyway, other than this, we added these two caveats because of uh, kind of using Rutgers research from the past. You know, we want you to understand how to install fence and please install it to spec. So these are things that we're asking you to uh, do and you should pick up in your package the spec here that we're gonna go over today. Ken Cove is gonna demonstrate. You got the woven wire fence you can go with, or, or the woven wire slash smooth wire, which, what's the, co what's the cost difference, John, not to put you on the spot, but between the two, just off the top of your head. All right, they'll go into that. Anyway, we're trying to allow some flexibility within the program. Um, 
you know, to allow, you don't have to build a Cadillac model. I mean, we want, you, we want it good because we're using taxpayer dollars. We want it to last, but nevertheless, we're allowing some dispensation. And you'll see here, that dispensation comes in the form of in-kind services. Uh, there's some family members here, young, young bucks ready to work for their dad. And I met one of you this morning. So you can use in-kind uh, cost to match your 50%. If you have locust posts, for example, on hand, doesn't mean you have to go with pressure treated. So we try to allow some dispensation for you all because I know the expense can be pretty significant. What's confusing here is that $200 an acre is, not, again, that's a relic of the old regulation. And that's not what you're fencing. 200 an acre is what you have preserved. So if you have 100 acres of preserved land, your cost share can be up to 20,000. Does that make sense? Versus $200 is not, if you're only fencing five acres, you're not, you know, but now we can only reimburse you for what you actually pay. But that's your total eligibility. So the bigger the farm, the more the cost share. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here, I want you all not to walk away with, uh, you know, we got, we got to keep this for at least 10 years. I think the lifespan is probably longer than that. But again, we erred on the side of caution. You could probably get, what, 20 years out of it, maybe, maybe longer. It's thought correctly, but we made it a lifespan of 10 years. And if we go out five years into it and it's been torn down, well, the state's going to recoup its money back. I don't see that happening, but you got to write it in because you never know what might happen. Anyway, you're here today because you have to complete this training. Uh, you got to install the fence according to the specifications. Ken Co is going to go over with you. Uh, you have to install within six months of approval of funding. I'm trying to toll that funding because you got approval back in May, but you don't have, we don't have money yet from the legislature. So it's not fair to hold you to six months when we've already eaten up three months waiting around for our money. So we'll start this six months that you have to commence the fencing uh, construction until you get the funding from the legislature. So I'll continue to be in conversation with you. And then you gotta complete this within three years. So sometimes with soil and water grants, Dave can maybe talk about that. We, get, we fund people and they never actually do it. We wanna recapture that money and give it to somebody who's gonna use it. Uh, see what else here. Dave's going to talk to you about conservation plans that you, that you need for this, uh, this grant award. And ultimately, once everything's been uh, installed, send us your bills. We'll reconcile them, see if they're reasonable, and then we'll send you a check for 50% of those costs. The last thing I'll mention here is how you all, how the whole program kind of fared. Other people called in and were curious who got funded. Uh, but before I go there, we put this ranking system together, and in fact, we didn't actually have to use it because if we had more applicants than money, we'd have to rank you. We didn't have to do that here. We had enough money for everybody. But our goal was to get fencing in the highest deer density areas and get the highest value crops fenced. And that was our goal. I think we actually achieved it in this first round. If you look at this is the geography of uh, deer fencing applications. And you can see here, they're in the, mo the vast majority uh, 29 out of 32 are located in areas of high deer density. Um, we nearly utilized the 500,000 uh, 500, that we earmarked, and then 30, almost 35 miles are proposed to be fenced this time around. So not a bad start against a pilot program. We'll see where it goes. Uh, this is a, uh, talking about high value crops, fruit, vegetable, and nursery constitute the majority of the crops being fenced. So we're not just fencing woods here. We're fencing high value crops. So again, I think there is, uh, this pilot's off to a good start. Now, just real briefly, in case you all come back to us again, you know, we probably need to rewrite the regulations. $200 an acre is pretty limiting. Um, tenant farmers can't apply for it. That can be limiting since 40% of the land in New Jersey is rented. These are all questions that we would have to consider that we proposed before the SADC of moving forward maybe we should write regulations for a deer, specific pro, uh, deer fencing specific program only. That way we don't have to retrofit these old rules to try to make it work. So, you know, um, one question that comes along here is the eight year program, which is the first farmland preservation program we had in New Jersey. It's, it's an eight year commitment instead of permanent. Maybe we can consider those in the next fencing round. So anyway, these are all policy considerations, but these are for the people who didn't get funded even though we funded 32 out of 46 applications, some folks just weren't eligible under the old rules. So if you write new rules, maybe everybody qualifies. So 
That being said, I don't know if you all have any questions before I turn it over to Dave. Okay, so as, as Jeff said, my name's Dave Clapp, and I work for the SADC. Um, and I think I've probably spoken to, to most of you through this process, um, trying to answer questions myself and, and Dave Kimmel. Um, so feel free to continue to, to call us as you go through the process. Um, you know, we're, we're the staff that's going to come out and take a look uh, at the end of the, the day to make sure that the fence is installed. So um, you know, best to, to keep asking us questions as we go forward. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about conservation planning. And so I, I just want to start with a uh, show of hands. Who's worked with uh, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service before we asked about uh, deer fence? So it looks, looks like a fair amount of you. And so, so the rest of you have now uh, at some point had contact with NRCS because we asked you to, if you hadn't had a plan, to work with NRCS to develop one. Um, and so you, you may not exactly understand what that is, but uh, the, the plan is basically a tool that's developed with professionals to help you manage the natural resources on your farms. Um, and what we're really concerned about for the deer fencing program is making sure uh, that we don't end up uh, helping you do something that might uh, and ultimately end up in a violation of your deed. Um, so as we're fencing areas, we, we may fence something that um, hasn't been productive for you and so you've kept it as a hay field or an area that you, um, you, know, you hadn't really used intensively because uh, the deer pressure was so great. Uh, once it's fenced, you may have interest in trying to do something uh, that's a little more intensive on the soil um, that could lead to erosion uh, and runoff, and those are things that could potentially be a violation of the deed. So the intent of getting a conservation plan through this program is just to make sure uh, that anything that we're helping you do uh, won't cause an issue for you down the line with, with our program. Um, so the, the conservation planning generally combines uh, your skills as, as land managers with uh, science-based assistance and, and technology from um, from an agency that's, that are professionals in management of things like erosion and, and uh, runoff. Um, and these are living documents, so you know we're, we're putting in the fence, you told us roughly what you're thinking you're going to plant in those areas. Um, down the line as that changes, a phone call to NRCS and you can continue to work with those folks to, to amend what you're doing. Um, and that's, that's really a great thing just for keeping yourself in compliance with, with our rules um, and, and making sure that the, the way you're managing your property um, is good for natural resources. Um, so aside from the reasons we've talked about, getting a conservation plan is a great way to validate the existing conservation measures you have on your farm. Uh, this can be really useful for things like uh, neighbor complaints and right to farm if you have a, a conservation plan. Uh, generally speaking, that goes a long way in, in addressing neighbor complaints. Um, it's a tool that can help you limit regulatory oversight. So, um, you know, if, if something is in a conservation plan, uh, NRCS has a process to go through to make sure that um, you're not in violation of any state rules like DEP rules. Um, and it's also all the DEP regulations generally have uh, some flexibility for farmers, and most of those uh, things that offer flexibility uh, require that you have a conservation plan. So it's really a great way to just make sure you're ahead of the game for, uh, for staying out of trouble with those folks. Um, NRCS can offer technical assistance and more importantly financial assistance. Uh, similar to deer fencing, they, they have um, conservation assistance for all sorts of natural resource management uh, goals that we're going to get into in a second. Um, and ultimately they can help you make your farm more profitable uh, while protecting the resource base. Um, so a little bit more about why we care. A uh, conservation plan is required by your deed of easement. Um, paragraph 7 in most of the deeds says that no activity shall be permitted on the premises, which would be detrimental to drainage, flood control, water conservation, erosion control, or soil conservation. Um, and so those are really the, the big ticket items for us is soil and water conservation. Um, and then specifically policy 53, the one that allows us to offer deer fence, uh, requires that you have an approved conservation plan uh, for the area that you're fencing. So again, that's to, to make sure that we don't have uh, erosion and runoff concerns from the area we help fence. Um, a little bit about NRCS. They're, they're the federal agency that helps with conservation planning. Um, NRCS is voluntary, and I think that's a really important part uh, to mention, that working with them, they're, they're not out to get you. They don't have a... Uh, 
a regulatory reason to, to turn you in or to, to um, you know, fine you or anything like that. They're completely voluntary. The required part is because your, your farm is preserved and because you've applied for this fencing, the SADC is requiring that you have a conservation plan. Um, NRCS will come out to your farm. They'll point out things that may be concerns for, for either the SADC or for DEP. Uh, but their job is not to turn you in. So, so my recommendation when you're working with NRCS is always to, to talk freely and open with them about what issues you have, and they can help you resolve them uh, before it would get to the point where you would need uh, you know, someone with a, a badge to come in and tell you that you can't do something. Um, and again, more importantly, they offer that financial assistance to farmers. Um, so NRCS really looks at resource concerns when they're out on a farm. And there's, there's quite a few. I, I mentioned that we're really concerned about soil and water. Uh, here's some examples of, of soil erosion concerns that we've seen. Um, you know, some of these are on preserved farms. This is one of our inspectors. Uh, so you can see this is a stream that's eroding into a crop field. And he's about six feet tall. So that's a pretty substantial erosion. Um, it doesn't all look like that. Sometimes it starts with a, a set of uh, tire tracks up a hill. Uh, it could be at the edge of a field where uh, things were plowed uh, a little too close without a buffer. And these, these all lead to uh, soil quality concerns. You're, you're losing your topsoil. Um, you have runoff. These are the sorts of things that cause neighbors to complain. Um, and that's, that's a process that we all try and avoid. Um, things that NRCS can do and, and help to pay for to fix them. Uh, filter strips between your rows uh, to, to keep the soil stable. Um, they can do grass waterways to help control those, those gully erosion areas. Uh, if you have a stream bank, they can help uh, to stabilize the stream. Uh, more waterways, and then if you have substantial erosion that has continued water through it, you can use uh, stone to build a waterway. So those, those are all sorts of ways that NRCS can help treat uh, erosion. I guess what I would say is if you see any of these things on your farm, uh, it's worth at least giving them a call and, and talking about it and they'll be able to help you uh, with a technical solution and potentially financial assistance. Um, water resource concerns, there's ponding, uh, there's irrigation efficiency, uh, drainage work, ditches, uh, maintaining existing drainage, um, filter strips at the edge of a field to capture the runoff uh, and, the, and the sediment and nutrients that come off with it, uh, irrigation storage, um, and nutrient management so they can help you with a facility um, to hold your, your pesticides and your chemicals uh, so that if there ever was a leak, it doesn't get into groundwater or surface water. Um, and so those are all things that, that either NRCS can offer assistance with or they have uh, partnerships with groups like us that can help pay for those things. Um, air quality, uh, NRCS is in the business of uh, helping to improve uh, air quality by reducing emissions. Um, and so that means replacing outdated diesel engines with new uh, higher efficiency engines uh, and, and also planting things like windbreaks near uh, facilities that have uh, odor complaints or odor issues. Um, plant concerns, NRCS can help with seasonal high tunnels to, um, to manage uh, your, your uh, microclimate to help you be able to grow your crops for a longer season. Um, cover crop, they can help uh, to pay for a cover crop to improve uh, the soil and, and uh, therefore have additional nutrients in the soil available for your next crop. And they can help with uh, plans to develop, developing plans for um, nutrient and pest management, so crop scouting. Um, I don't know if many of you have, have livestock, but uh, NRCS can also assist with um, you know, proper grazing, uh, with confinement areas and with, uh, with manure storages. So instead of having a, an open lagoon, uh, having a, a facility where you can manage your, your, uh, the nutrients that, that uh, are excreted in manure in a way that you'll have a way to beneficially reuse those without causing environmental degradation. Um, and energy is a fairly new one for NRCS, but they're, uh, they're helping to uh, develop uh, energy audits to determine if there's ways to improve the efficiency of your, of your lighting and your electrical systems. Um, and so they can pay for um, enhancing uh, with, with 
new uh, lights and new fans, and also with uh, with some forms of solar energy. Not not whole farm solar, but uh, for things like livestock water uh, and and small well pumps. Um, so those are the the resource concerns that NRCS is really looking at. And again, if you have any any questions. Um, those are the types of things that they can help with. Um, that's certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but those are things that would be worth uh, going to your local office to talk about. Uh, my name is Aaron Geikma. I'm the state director for the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services Program here in New Jersey. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about fencing, um, just a little bit, but also um, I just kind of want to ex explain uh, our program. Um, we are a federal program. Uh, we operate, basically, we can provide technical assistance to help resolve uh, wildlife problems. Um, we also do some operational control to uh, control wildlife that are causing problems. Uh, in New Jersey here, the way that um, we work, we focus mainly on birds. And Tony in the back with New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife, they focus uh, mainly on mammals. We have an MOU between our two agencies that kind of divides the, uh, you know, the expertise accordingly. Um, and Tony will talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, wildlife does cause a lot of problems with agriculture. You guys know that. You know, you're here because deer are, you know, causing problems with your crops, but there's also other species that can cause problems. Um, you know, Canada geese is a big one uh, throughout the state. Uh, even uh, turkey vultures um, cause some problems with livestock, cattle. Um, there's a number of issues. Uh, you know, we were showing that slide earlier, uh, that some of John's research number of dollar values associated with different species. Uh, you know, if you did that now, I would guess geese would be a little bit higher. I would guess woodchucks would maybe be a little bit lower. Um, but you guys raise good stuff and there's always something that wants to eat it is pretty much the take home message. Um, you know, we can help you out. Uh, our agency can give you um, technical assistance, give you advice, help you get the, the permits required. You know, if you want to start removing wildlife that's causing problems, we can give you recommendations for, you know, other alternatives that could help you out, whether it's repellents, um, you know, or we can get into, I didn't get too much into different types of fencing. You know, John was mention, mentioning uh, temporary electric fencing. There's all kinds of options out there, um, you know, for, for different methods to try and just reduce the damage and you know, try and focus on, you know, just reducing that damage when, um, you know, crops are ready, and when your crops are most vulnerable. So I'm just going to go ahead and talk just a little bit here about fencing. Um, you know, this picture is actually from a project when I was in Michigan that we were doing, uh, and that was trying to protect food sources. In this case, it's stored hay um, from deer that uh, were infected with bovine TB and there was concern about spreading diseases between um, the deer and also livestock. So this is just, uh, you know, it's, it's a temporary electric fence, um, you know, multiple strand electric fence. Um, and when you're considering uh, deer fencing, a couple of things you need to think about. One, biology of deer, you know, how high can they jump? What can they squeeze through? What can they squeeze under? Also, why do they want to go through a fence? Um, you know, the economics of fencing. Just, I'll talk a little bit about fence design, just some consideration, um, and a little bit about, you know, the importance of, if you have a fence, inspecting your fence. And you'll notice a lot of the pictures that I have here, we do a lot of work with airports, trying to prevent deer from getting into airports. So you'll notice a lot of the fencing is this, uh, you know, eight foot chain link with barbed wire on the top. Um, so deer biology, this is some research that uh, Wildlife Services did, um, you know, just trying to figure out just how high of a fence can a deer get over. Uh, this was done, actually it was in Wisconsin, um, and they captured a bunch of deer, put them in an enclosure, and start put it, putting various heights of fence across the middle of the enclosure. Um, pretty much five, five foot fence did not stop a dang thing. 
Uh, every, deer, every deer that was in there could get over it regardless of, you know, condition of the deer. You start going up to a six foot fence, okay, it kept out 14% of the deer. Uh, you, then if you go up to a seven foot fence, kept out 85% of the deer. You got up to an eight foot fence, it kept out every, you know, all the deer. You know, other consideration, you guys are putting, putting together fences. Um, you know, and everybody always asks, well, how high can a deer jump? Okay, we covered that. The other thing that people don't think about sometimes is how else can a deer get through a fence? You know, they can get um, in between gaps under fences that are up to 10 inches deep. So, you know, if you, and also lateral gaps, typically these are gaps around gates, seven and a half inches. Um, if you guys want a good guide, you all have a piece of paper in front of you that's eight and a half by 11. If you hold that up to your, you know, your gate and, you know, the gap between the gates is as wide as that piece of paper, a deer can get through it. And if you hold it lengthwise underneath your fence and there's a gap underneath it there, a deer can get under that. So just, you know, just a consideration when you're thinking about um, these fences, uh, when you're installing fences and when you're having other folks install your fences. I'll go back just one second here. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is why is a deer trying to get through the fence? You know, is, it, is a deer trying to get, you know, to the food on the other side? Is a deer, you know, so interested in what's inside the fence, it's a better alternative than what's outside the fence? That's one alternative. The other alternative is, you know, is there a predator of some kind or possibly a human that's causing that deer to try and want to get over, under, through a fence. Um, you know, in the fall, during the reproductive season, that's another drive for a deer. They may just want to get, keep on moving and, and get, uh, get to reproducing. That's another consideration. Um, another aspect with fence, uh, and, and it's kind of been alluded to several times, um, you know, what's the value of the crop that you're protecting? Uh, John was talking about soybeans. He calls them uh, treats for deer. M&Ms. M&Ms for deer. You know, as he was saying, they're cheap to plant, they're cheap to produce, um, you know, versus, you know, some of the um, orchard crops where they're not cheap to produce and they're very, you know, they're very valuable crops. So is it worth it fencing soybeans? Maybe not. Is it worth it fencing orchard crops? Definitely. Um, you also have to consider the amount of damage that you're getting from, from deer in the first place. Um, you know, and you guys probably have all kind of gone through the mental math, figuring out what percentage of your crops you guys think you're losing to deer. Um, you know, John was showing the, or they were showing the numbers earlier, the, the dollar value lost. There's quite a bit of, there's quite a bit of damage there. Uh, you know, you also have to think about the cost of fencing. Um, well, in this case, 50% of the fencing, you know, is that, you know, what's, you know, is the value of the crop you're selling worth more than the cost of the fence? And then you also have to consider the lifespan of the fence. Um, you know, the fence design for this program, um, you know, the woven wire and the uh, high tensile, it's a very good fence. It's a very long lasting fence. Um, you know, but you also have to think about that. A little bit about fence designs. Uh, this is, a, this is uh, from some fencing research related to deer damage. Um, essentially, how cost effective is the fence? So if you figure uh, P equals the perimeter, A equals the area, we'll just do easy math because it's the morning yet. Um, you know, we'll, we'll say one area of perimeter is a dollar and, the air, and one square is an acre, one little square is an acre. So if you're just fencing one acre, and it's gonna cost you $4 to do it, you're, you're paying $4 an acre. If you bump up the size of that fence to, uh, you know, this is four acres and you have a perimeter of eight, you're down to $2 per acre. Now, if you keep going, it keeps getting more, I mean, the total dollar value is getting more, but the acreage you're protecting is increasing at a, at a different rate. So just something to consider. Uh, fence shape is also uh, can play into that. You know, bigger contiguous blocks um, again are more uh, cost effective. 
you know, if you, you know, basically you're trying to uh, reduce your perimeter, you know, so you're doing a square, uh, your perimeter is 16, area 16, your cost would be a dollar per acre. Now if you do long, or if you do a rectangular shape, you've got a perimeter of 20, an area 16, so that's $1.25 dollars per acre. And then if you go to the extreme and you just do one big long linear, same 16 acres, perimeter 34, you're at a cost of $2.13 per acre. Um, and the other thing that's not uh, accounted for in this is, um, you know, research has been shown with some of the fencing that 80 to 85 percent of the material costs are in the corners and ends of a fence. So if you start doing all kinds of weird angles, you start adding a whole lot of, you know, a, a whole lot of extra material costs that you might not have to have if you just do one big block of fenced area. The other thing to consider um, when you guys are coming up with your fences is as far as gates, what types of gates are you looking at? And there's different types of gates that are out there. Um, you know, when you guys pulled in, there's actually at the Snyder Farm, there's an automatic gate over here. Uh, there's a manual gate over here. Uh, manual gates are great. They're cheap. Um, you know, the only issue with manual gates is are people going to close them consistently because you really don't want to leave, if you're putting all this funding into fencing, you don't want to continually leave your gates open and have the potential of a deer getting into your fence um, because deer fences make great deer traps. Once they get in, sometimes they have a hard time getting out. So then you've got a deer running around your fence, pacing up and down your fence line. Um, and that's best case scenario. Sometimes they're bouncing off your fence and your neighbor's calling you going, hey, you got a deer in there, you need to get them out of there. Um, so just another factor can, to consider. Uh, automatic gates, John will tell you they're expensive. Um, and they can be, uh, you know, there can be some issues with uh, the opening, closing, all that kind of good stuff. But they are a good option. Um, but just keep in mind, they are really expensive. Uh, another option is cattle guards. This is a picture of a cattle guard. That's just actually wire grate down there. That's like two inch wire grate. There's other versions uh, made of concrete. You can get prefab versions of it. Or if you go to some of your livestock uh, supply places, they will have cattle guards like that. Cattle guards are great because, you know, then you don't, if you're going through them, they're, you don't have to stop, open your gates, close your gates behind you when you're pulling equipment in and out of your fence. Um, you know, if you've got a, an area that's a gate that's going to be extremely high use, it might be something to consider. Um, these next two are kind of some weird, not weird, I guess, underutilized types of gates. Um, the bump gates, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the bump gate. Essentially, this is a version of a bump gate. Um, essentially, you can just drive into this. Uh, this is an opener here. Push on that. and the, this is, has a spring on each side, spring loaded, and there's a, a latch over here. So when this is pushed, the gate will spring open in that direction. And then there's uh, another spring on a post over here. So when the gate opens, it hits it and then closes the gate behind you. Um, it's an option. There's a lot of uh, mechanics in there, so it takes a lot of fine tuning to get that, to get that right. But it's another gate option. Um, and there's even uh, some electrified cattle mats have been tested to try and keep deer out of fences. Um, and they are fairly effective as long as they have power and they're on. Um, when they're testing them, they had some, some issues with, uh, with the gates or with those electronic gates being um, shut off. Um, you know, just some options for, for gates. Uh, you know, gates are typically the weakest point in any fence. Uh, again, here's a picture before. This is actually a gate with uh, some deer that were walking right through the gate. You can see the tracks in the snow there. And this is one of my favorite pictures of a cattle guard. This is a rather large buck that, um, this is an airfield that we work on. Three nights in a row he went over that same cattle guard. Every night went over that same cattle guard. Um, so. You know, you have to just make sure that your gates are secure and not letting deer in. Um, 
Other things to consider once you have your fence up is try and have some schedule of fence inspections on there. Um, you know, things you find, one, keep your gates closed. Also check your gaps under, under your gates um, and also in between your gates. Um, also look for spots where critters have dug under your fence because once they start using them, they tend to keep using them and other critters find them and will enlarge those holes. Um, you know, if a, if a dog can fit under there, certainly a deer can fit under there. If it has a proper motivation, it's going to go under there, get in your fence, and again, you're going to get a call from your neighbors going, we got a deer bouncing off our, our fence trying to get out. Um, another option, or another thing to keep in mind is things can happen to your fence once you have it up. Uh, it, it's inevitable. Um, you know, a tree branch falls on it, takes down part of your fence, uh, you know, or a portion along a road, someone goes off the road and puts their car through your fence. Those are things you want to find rather quickly before it's been down for two weeks and now you have, you know, a dozen deer wandering around your, your fence. Uh, other things to keep in mind, you know, no, no fence is truly deer proof. Um, you know, and I think you have to be prepared to uh, remove deer or be willing to try and get those deer out of there, either chase them out if possible, um, or be prepared to remove deer. Um, so that means having, you know, one, the proper permits, and Tony, I'm sure we'll talk about that back there, since his agency is the one that issues the, uh, the permits for, for deer. Um, and then also, you know, consider having also deer hunting going on concurrently you know, on your property just to help reduce the deer population right around your, uh, you know, right around your fenced areas and your agricultural areas. Um, and this is something I kind of throw in every presentation I give about wildlife. You know, there is no magic bullet. There's not one thing that's going to be 100% effective at, uh, at keeping deer out of your crops. You know, uh, fencing is definitely, it's expensive. Um, but it is very effective at, uh, at preventing deer from damaging your stuff. Um, but John kind of got into it a little bit too. Um, you know, you have to have other wildlife management strategies because wildlife is, is willing to adapt. Um, you know, and you know, if you look around this room, you'll see things on integrated uh, pest management. Keep those practices going related um, you know, to wildlife, related to deer. Habitat management, John talked about, you know, some of the willows um, or even soybeans, using them kind of as a lure crop to try and, and just kind of keep deer in certain areas and avoid certain areas. You know, that would be an, um, an example of habitat. Physical exclusion, fencing. Um, you know, going to be expensive, but it's going to be your longest lasting method of uh, controlling wildlife. Uh, wildlife population management, we talked about that just a little bit. Um, you know, that's going to be your hunting, any kind of permits you have to remove deer, and that's certainly going to help you out um, just trying to minimize the, the local population, minimize the damage. Um, you know, changing cultural practices, you know, that's as easy as making sure gates get shut, um, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. Things that you can you can do on your own to try and uh, minimize damage. Morning. Um, so yeah, uh, like Aaron was mentioning before, uh, USDA Wildlife Services works a lot with migratory birds and uh, did a lot of work on airports, keeping wildlife uh, off of the runways and things like that. Division of Fish and Wildlife has a wildlife control section and we deal primarily with the mammal species like black bears, white-tailed deer, sometimes we do coyote work, sometimes we do beaver work, um, and we also work with wild turkeys as well. So, just want to talk a little bit about our deer management programs. So, we're all familiar with the problems associated with white-tailed deer in New Jersey when you get a large population or a high density, you have a lot of vehicle collisions, homeowners are complaining about their shrubs and flowers, problems with forest regeneration. You may have heard about our lack of understory in areas where we have got a lot of high deer density. Of course, agricultural damage. And uh, people are concerned with Lyme disease in this state because of the large uh, deer population. 
So one of the programs that's been instituted is this community-based deer management program. Now, we've done a good job in a lot of the huntable area of the state. At you know 30 years of management, we've got the, the state zoned into several areas based on habitat and other, other factors. And we're getting complaints from some hunters that they're not seeing as many deer as they used to see, which tells us that in some areas uh, the program is working, but not all of the state is huntable. And there's a lot of suburban areas in the state with a high deer population, and those areas need some assistance. So community-based deer management allows a community, uh, any township in the state can apply for this, to have some other means of controlling um, the deer herd, the deer density, besides hunting. Wherever possible, we utilize existing deer seasons to get this done. And in certain areas, certain township properties have been opened for hunting. We're committed at Division of Fish and Wildlife to allowing or, or um, getting townships to use sport hunting whenever possible because it's a very cheap and effective way of controlling the deer herd. But we realize that this can't occur in all areas. So we're flexible when it comes to deer management in areas where you can't have hunting. So there's a statute um, that allows this. Uh, county boards of agriculture can apply, airports can apply, and municipalities can apply for community-based deer management. So what happens is the community will contact the Division of Fish and Wildlife and say, we have a problem, we'd like to start a program, and then we'll review different management options with the community. Uh, the community or the Depart uh, uh, County Board of Agriculture uh, completes their application and they provide certain documentation and then we would recommend whether or not that program can continue. Ultimately it goes to our Fish and Game Council for a vote and then the permit is issued and signed by our director. These programs have to go through uh, municipal township resolution uh, people will come in and testify about overabundant deer and some of the problems they're having to get uh, this program instituted in their township. And each applicant has to demonstrate the need. So significant damage to property, significant number of vehicle collisions, significant number <coughs> of uh, amount of agricultural damage, things of that nature. Some of the options that are allowed under community-based deer management, in addition to um, hunting, contraception can be applied for, sterilization. I don't believe we've had uh, many of these passed using uh, contraception techniques. Um, those techniques tend to work in island situations but are difficult to institute in large land masses. Uh, trap and transfer of deer is an option. Uh, trapping and euthanize. Uh, this is done down in Princeton where deer actually are, are caught in nets and euthanized afterwards. And then either sharpshooters or uh, different types of sport hunting uh, on township properties that are open. And one of the stipulations is that the venison has to be donated uh, to a community food bank under this program. So oftentimes the, the uh, culling will be done on certain days on certain township properties. They'll have sometimes a, a butcher set up right there um, where the hunt is taking place so that the deer can be immediately processed and then sent to the food banks. It can be expensive to institute a program like this. Um, a lot of hours per deer and a lot of money per deer um, including um, so for the different the different options immunocontraception is one of the most expensive you have to wait for the right animal to come by the actual darts that are used with the sterilization agent are expensive um, trapping and transferring can be very expensive to institute a lot of money for the trap and about a hundred dollars per deer uh, paying agents to shoot the deer is very expensive 
Uh, butchering fees are expensive as well. And sport hunting, when you can do it, is the cheapest alternative. This is just an example of some of the towns that have been part of the program over the last 20 years or so. And uh, a lot of these towns continue to implement the program, and many of them have had a lot of success at reducing their deer herd. This is, uh, I guess, in 2014 and 15. There were three of these issued and resulting in 370 deer called under this program. So that's one of the programs. Another one I wanted to mention is this Deer Management Assistance Program, or DMAP. Um, this is a way for, in certain areas of the state where we have a limited take of antlerless deer, like this part of the state here, there's a lot of take of, uh, of antlerless deer, and a lot of zones, the bag limit is unlimited if you're taking antlerless deer or does. Uh, some parts of the state have a limited season because the goal for the population in that part of the state might be to increase or stabilize the herd, actually. Um, so under this assistance program, sometimes you'll have farm fields in these areas that are uh, slated for an increase in the deer herd because the overall habitat is poor. But if you've got a crop and you've got irrigation and it can be a magnet for, magnet for deer, this program allows for farmers to get some assistance, for example, um, increasing the bag limit in their local area on their farm so that they can get more, um, so they can shoot more deer. It can also be done on municipal lands in addition to private lands. And these permits that are issued under the DMAP program are valid for taking two additional uh, antlerless deer. Here's a map of our deer management zones. The blue areas on the map are the areas where this deer management assistance program is utilized. So uh, there may not be many farms that have applied for fencing that fall within these blue areas. But generally, the Pinelands areas uh, have a very limited take of antlerless deer. And also along the Kittatinny Ridge in northern New Jersey and over in uh, West Milford and Vernon. So if you've got a farm in any of those areas and you'd like to try to increase your, your uh, uh, number of permits that are issued and increase the ability of your hunters to take female deer, then, um, then this program would be, would be right for you. And with that DMAP program, of course, if uh, farms are applying for increased take of antlerless deer, we want to see that you're also hunting the farm to control deer damage. And we need to see several years of, I think it's three years, of a log of how many deer have been taken on that property. So you can demonstrate the damage, but you also want to have a harvest record. All your hunters should be coming in, logging in every day and uh, identifying the sex of the deer they're taking so that you have some evidence to say we're doing all we can, but we still have a lot of agricultural damage and we need to uh, step up our effort. Some of you may have also received farmer depredation permits or permits to kill wild deer for controlling uh, deer damage during the summer months that we issue. So we've got these depredation permits, we call them, or permits to kill wild deer that basically say the owner or lessee of a farm experiencing agricultural damage can get a permit to kill deer that are causing the damage on those lands. And this is what the permit looks like. Basically, at the top of the form, the farmer's name, the permittee is listed. It can be the owner of the farm. It can be the person that leases the farmland. And it'll have some dates on there by which the, the permit is issued that allow the, the culling of wild deer. In general, these permits are issued for about six months right now. If you have extenuating circumstances and you needed it for a little bit longer, you could talk with the conservation officer that issues the permits. But they're for very specific fields, specific crops. And you can have a number of agents uh, on the permit that are allowed to shoot deer 24 hours per day, seven days per week. Um, they can be shooting at night. We require our agents to not only have uh, taken the hunter safety course, so you've got a, um, a 
firearm hunting license in New Jersey, a conservation ID number, but also if you're transporting firearms to the farm address to conduct the work under the permit to shoot, you need to have the uh, New Jersey Firearm Purchaser's ID card, which allows you to transport firearms other than for the purpose of hunting. So that's why that number is required as well. For the farmer and staff that might live there on the farm address, there's no transport of firearms involved, so those folks wouldn't need to have the, uh, the purchaser's ID card. The way this works right now, and my unit used to issue these permits years ago. Um, wildlife Control used to visit the farm and inspect the damage and issue these. Uh, at one point, it was giving to, given to the conservation officers for them to issue. Then for a while, our deer project biologists were doing the legwork to issue these. Now the issuance of these permits is back under the conservation officers again. So the process now is to contact uh, your local conservation officer. I have a map here if you'd like to pick one up later. Basically shows the regions of the state and the phone numbers to call if you've got deer damage and you'd like to get a permit, if you're not familiar with that already. Um, fill out the application. They can be emailed or faxed to that regional office. And also, if you lease the land, uh, we require a lease agreement from the owner, and the lease agreement has to say that you're allowed to shoot deer during the summer months under a permit to kill wild deer. And the reason for that is we've had complaints where the landowner leased the farm and the landowner has a hunting club during the, the winter months or for some reason doesn't want any deer shot and then the person that leases the farm gets the permit and it's created some controversy so they want to see some kind of agreement if you don't own the, the land. Each and every time the permit is issued the farm has to be reinspected. Uh, part of this is to ensure that there are no new houses that went up nearby that might be um, downrange of any shooting that would be going on just for safety reasons and the conservation officers are holding tight to reporting so if they have not received a report of the activities under the permit to shoot you can't be issued another permit until uh, the report comes in of the activities Typically, you're going to have right around a 10, 12 inch auger is what most augers are going to be set up with to do your post. Um, drill the hole. If you've got mostly topsoil, it'd uh, be recommended to put the, once you dig the hole, put the post in, do about 8, 10 inches of cement, then do 18 to 22 inches of dirt, another 8, 10 inches of cement, and just keep layering that way. When you put it in, tamp each layer as you go. The cement does not need to be mixed. You can put it in dry and just let the moisture out of the ground uh, soak into it. Um, if you're dealing with some more clay type soil, uh, you don't need to do any cement. You can just pack it back in tight, let it sit a few days before you start doing your fence construction. Uh, one of our uh, tools that we have when you're doing the auger, we sell a tamper. It's weighted on the bottom end. The handle's just a, a tube. One thing I've done at home with them is I'll put a longer tube in it and actually put a bow in the handle. It keeps your hands further away from the post while you're tamping it. Less chance of running your knuckles against the post, so I'm get, getting hurt that way. Another way to put the post in the ground is driving them. We've got two different drivers set up here. Uh, the one set up on the Ford tractor is probably the most common that people are familiar with. That one there is a shaver driver. There's several different companies that make them. We've, there's Shaver, Work Saver, uh, Kenco, we make one as well, uh, but it operates off of hydraulics. Use hydraulic pressure to raise the beam, and then it's a free fall with spring assist to pull the beam back down to pound the post. Um, they come in several different sizes, uh, eight inch, 10 inch, and 12 inch beams on them so that you can uh, do different d diameters of posts. Another one that Ken Cove does is a Kiwi driver. It's more of a commercial grade, but it's gonna be your top of the line, higher impact, 
So on ranges of impact from the units are going to go from 30,000 pounds on your smaller ones up to 120,000 pounds of impact on your larger units. Um, the other unit we have here is our Kencove Nitro. It's based off of a uh, concrete breaker, a rock breaker setup. It runs nitrogen over hydraulic. It's basically a self-contained system. Hook into your auxiliaries on your skid loader. Uh, we also offer them for excavators. But hook into the auxiliary, uh, you're going to get four to 800 beats a minute out of them on it. We offer that in two different sizes, our 750 and the 1000. Um, they, we started selling them the end of 2012 and we've actually had a lot of our contractors now starting to switch over to them just because of the ease of use, low center of gravity. Um, the only thing with the skid steer unit is you're limited to the height of the skid steer lift. So where your hinge pin is, some of them are only going to go up to 9, 10 feet. Some of the bigger skid steers can go a little higher. So you're limited there. This excavators, same thing, but a lot of those we're seeing guys doing 12 and 14 foot posts, pounding them into the ground with them. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a demo with this one here. Put a post in the ground so you guys can see how it operates. Um, it will be loud, so you might want to put your fingers in your ears. Okay, we're going to start off with talking about building a corner. And the best way to think about the corner of your fence, it's like the foundation of your house. If you don't have a strong foundation, eventually it's going to fall over. Okay? So when we were pounding posts, Haas talked a little bit about the fact that these corners and end posts, you want at least four foot in the ground. And then as far as line posts go, if you get them three foot in the ground, um, you'll be fine. So we've got your vertical post and then we've got what we're going to call a horizontal brace post. And the best way to determine how long your horizontal brace post needs to be is um, two times longer than your fence is tall. So if we're building a six foot fence, we need a 12 foot brace. If we're building an eight foot fence, we need a 16 foot brace. So that's the best way to remember it. You always want to be twice as long as your fence is tall. And then you're going to run a diagonal fence brace wire, which will help hold this post from heaving up out of the ground. So um, Haas on this post is going to show you how to use what we refer to as Gripple's Quick Brace Kit. Um, it, some contractors will use these just because they're time saving and time is money and things are more efficient that way. If this is a project that you're getting out and doing yourself, I would recommend it from a time savings um, aspect and not having to do a figure eight with high tensile wire. So we'll show you the quick brace on this end. And then up there, we've already got some um, diagonal brace cables in with high tensile fence wire in a figure eight style. So we can talk about those when we go up there. And if you guys um, haven't seen one of those built, we'll, we'll definitely take the time to build one of those for you as well. You've got brace pins that come through here. So on this side, you could use a five inch brace pin and you're gonna pre-drill it into, um, put it into this side, pre-drill your post right here so that it slides on over top of the brace pin. On this side, we've probably got a 12 inch brace pin and it goes the whole ways through. So we've drilled this post the whole ways through, pre-drilled this and slid it on, pounded it in. But you need to leave this little nub stick out right here so that you can um, rest your brace cable on top of it. So on this end, you're gonna rest your brace cable on top of the brace pin. And on this side, uh, we've already got some staples in here to keep it from digging into the post itself. And so it'll easily glide around the side of the post. Think safety when you guys are out doing this. Haas has safety glasses on, I do. A staple can quickly reflect back, take out an eye, a burr on the end of a wire that springs back. Um, we hear constant stories in the office of accidents that happen like that, or you just get to the end of the job and you're sweaty, so you take your glasses off to pound that one last staple and, and you're on your way to your hospital. So things like steel-toed shoes, safety glasses, gloves, anything to protect yourself um, against some of the hazards out here is very helpful. So this is a pre-made cable. Um, does up to a 16-foot brace, right, Haas? I think. 
And we don't have 16 foot here. So this, this, this cable should do it. So it's got a, a pre-made uh, like snare loop at the end. Hoss is gonna snake that through there. Your staple's keeping that from lifting up on you. And then the kit comes with, you got the gripple with you, comes with the gripple, which is basically like a, can I describe it as a rolling wire vise? It's got a little roller inside. The cable goes in and then comes back through and can't go, can't reverse back out. You can finish pushing it through, but you can't reverse it back out. Basically, he's just grabbing that cable and torquing it through the, the gripple to put the tension onto the cable. And you can see how tight that got. Um, these gripples, you leave this out here for a while, you're not going to be able to release the pressure and do this again just because dirt's going to get up in there. But if you found that you've put that gripple down too far or you'd like to move it up a little bit, there is a little pinhole right here and there's a release tool that when you originally do it, you could release it and start over. Um, just a little bit simpler than doing the uh, figure eight with high tensile fence wire. You don't have to break out the spinning jenny, go through the hoops of that. A um, little bit more pricey, but a little bit time, time savings and efficient. Okay, so we're gonna go head back up to that end and roll out our woven wire and we can talk about the um, wire diagonals up there as well. Okay, so now we've got a corner assembly here. So at every corner or where your fence is kind of gonna round a bend, anything greater than what, Hoss? Uh, 20, 30 degree angle, you're gonna wanna brace that so that it takes the pressure off those posts going around the corner or around the edge of the field. <clears throat> this was um, here, but Haas and I took out the crimp sleeve. You'll see on this uh, brace cable over here, there's, it was basically pulled together with wire um, stretchers, chain walks, and then crimped. That is, that is an option. I'm not going to promise you with that option, though, in a couple of years or six months when the ground settles, you're not going to have to find a way to tighten it. A lot of people will tell you that you won't but we came out here, shook this one, and put a strainer in. There's no way to tighten that assembly without dismantling it. Um, so I would recommend, if you're not gonna go with the quick brace, that you use a strainer within the assembly. Um, so basically, you're gonna have your spinning jenny set up. You're gonna pull your wire out, starting down here, go to the outside, come back to the inside, and basically make a figure eight and cross these wires. Now you don't want to intertwine them, but you just want to lay them over like a figure eight. Two passes, and then put in your, your ratchet strainer. In this particular instance, we use what we call a quick strainer or a quick end strainer. Um, this is a 12, the wire gauge uh, vice right here that holds 12 and a half gauge wire. So I, didn't, I just plug it right in, and it doesn't pull back out. Um, I can reuse it by snipping the wire and pushing it the rest of the way through, so it's not a once and done device. But I didn't have to use a crimp tool and crimps to hold it in place and ratchet it till you get that really tight kind of vibe to the, the, the diagonal. Um, we're going to start out building six foot tall woven wire. Six and a half. Six and a half graduated spacing so um, whenever you lay out your wire row you got to make sure that you've laid it out in a manner that your graduated spacing is down here so that when you flip it up it's at the bottom of your post it's very simple to lay this roll the other way stretch it roll it out and then go oh no <laughs> it's a lot of effort then to roll it back up and stick it back out so make sure your graduated spacing is toward the bottom so when you stand it up um, it's in the proper position so we're going to basically start and roll this around the corner but then stand it up before we go around the corner and tie off the end. So we'll focus on tying off the end and then uh, pushing it around the rest of the fence here.
Yep. If you guys can come a little bit closer, woven wire has all about three different types of knots. Um, I think your contract uh, reads you can use the hinge joint here or the fixed knot, which is up over here. Um, we always kind of preach that that hinge joint is just fine for keeping animals for exclusion. Uh, maybe not so much for containment because the flex of the knots, but because there's going to be little to no pressure, pressure on the wire, hinge joint is just fine. And you'll basically see that the, um, the, the verticals come up and hinge or wrap around the horizontals. So you do get a little bit of flex there. Um, whereas the fixed knot over here is a completely separate knot. It's its own piece of wire. So you've got horizontals and verticals that cross and then you've got a separate piece of wire that knots around it. Um, the other is a, an S knot shape, which again is its own, we don't have any of it here with us, but its own um, horizontal vertical and then just a little S that goes around. And it's, it's probably, it could be used for containment, but you're way better off with a hinge joint or a fixed knot. Fixed knot is, is more expensive than hinge joint. There's no flex to these knots. You're not gonna flex the vertical down over the horizontal. Whereas with the hinge joint, if something were to put pressure on here, you can definitely spin this. But with exclusion, you know, you don't have things climbing on the fences or cattle pushing up against it or anything, put actually putting um, pressure on the fence. So hinge joint's just fine. This is a class three galvanized. Um, be cautious when you're buying your wire, you do want a class three galvanized. It's gonna last 30 to 40 years versus a class one that you might get at a, a retail store level that's, you know, you could put it up one day and come out in 30 days and it's got some, some rust on it. So um, the systems that like we like to say is build it to last. And you know, if you've got a wood post that's gonna last 30 years, put wire on it that's gonna last 30 years. So you're not out here maintaining year after year. If you use CCA treated post and class three galvanized wire, class three accessories to go with it. You're not, you're, there's little to no maintenance to these fences. Aside from keeping trimmed below them, you don't want, you don't want vegetation growing up in, holding the moisture in, um, things of that nature. You know, John, John's our pesticide expert. So you can see they keep their fence lines really clean here and that's what you'd, you'd want to, you know, if you, if you're not, don't want to use pesticides, you definitely want to keep that trimmed or weed eated. And you can leave this fence up off the ground you know, enough that you can get that weed eater right under there without, you know, busting up your weed eater or hitting the fence. You can leave it up off the ground, you know, three, four, five inches, what, you know, whatever you prefer whenever you're building the fence. Okay, we're gonna push this that way and start to install some woven wire for you. You're gonna hand tie this one, Haas? So there's a couple of different ways that you could um, terminate the end of your woven wire. Our recommendation is to encompass the whole post and come back on the wire itself. So on this end, Haas is gonna hand tie it with his little flat wire twist tool. When we get to the other end, we're gonna terminate with gripple T-clips and just show you a couple of different avenues that you can <clears throat> take with terminating the wire. So he's taking the tail end of his wire getting it around the post, and then he's gonna hand wrap it to itself. If you get your roll, roll of wire and your tails aren't long enough, you may just have to snip your knots back and create yourself a longer tail. Okay, so Haas has just a little wee tiny hand tool there. He's gonna put on the side of that, it catches the tail, and then he can just flip it around and it creates himself a, a hand knot there. Um, this woven wire is, what, 180, 180 PSI, so just to do that with your hands gets pretty tiresome and, and could take a while, but that little handy tool there will just, just kind of basically creates its own hinge knot. And as you work your way to the bottom, with the graduated spacing, it will get tighter to try and get this tool and everything to work around it. So sometimes you got to work the wire as you work the tool to get it to fit through the spacing. So Haas is going to go ahead and cut his woven wire, but he's going to cut it with uh, enough excess so that he can pull it around 
and terminate it off the post here. But you usually want to go more than you actually need, so. Yep. More is always better. Uh, you can always cut it off. It's a bit more challenging to uh, reattach it. On this end, to terminate it, we're actually going to use a product that Gripple makes. It's called a Gripple T-Clip. Again, I mean, hand knotting's just labor. These are about dollar a piece so and you've got 14 lines you've got 14 dollars in an end termination um, but if you want to make quick use of your time these work exceptionally well he needs the tail on both sides for splicing so that's why he's going ahead and nipping that knot off so he's got a stretcher bar there and then we have the wire wedges so essentially, every line of wire has to be within a wedge so that you're pulling, oops, pulling even tension on every line wire. So if you skip and don't have a wedge on top of that top line wire, your fence is going to tension unevenly. To do a center pull, you obviously need two bars. So, so basically it's just walking back the chain, pulling the wi wire tight. Just want to go back and forth evenly. I'm going to now connect the two rolls of in essence, this could be connecting two rolls of wire or splicing the tension point. You do both the same way. You know, basic difference between the crimp sleeve and the gripple is, is we can go back later on and, and tension the gripple if, if there's some room there to tension it. So once that's crimped, that's crimped. Once that's crimped, that's crimped. You can just see the time difference between using a gripple and, and using crimp sleeves. And notice the uniformity that was mentioned earlier with. He's going to crimp a long sleeve three times. Um, so we've got the both sides of the wire uh, connected with either crimp sleeves or a medium gripple. As far as the end tails go, you can either cut those off or you can bend them back on themselves around the wire. We'll go ahead and release the chain grabs and check the tension on our fence. The key to stapling woven wire is, is that you don't want to drive the staple home. You want to leave enough space between the post and the wire that the wire can just kind of float between there. Because you want all the pressure to be on your corner assembly. When you staple it tight, you're putting pressure on each individual post. And then you'll allow for sag in between your posts. When you're doing woven wire, generally you want to do your top two wires bottom two wires and then every other one in between. So, and on a corner post like this. Same as with your wire and your, your set accessories, you wanna make sure you have a class three galvanized staple. Uh, the staple that Haas is using is double barbed. You can get your hands on a hot dip staple versus an electro plated. When you pound a hot dip staple, you'll probably actually see some of the fragments of galvanization popping off. Um, the staples that we prefer are, are an electroplated. When you hit them, the galvanization's not going to pop off. You, I mean, if you, if you want to do every wire, you can, 
But doing every other wire, especially for an exclusion fence, is more than enough. We're going to run the strand of smooth wire on the top. We've got 12 and a half gauge high tensile, um, 200 KSI smooth wire on the spinning jenny here. Haas will pay it out around the corner and we'll terminate the ends and throw a strainer in the center. There's already one smooth wire up there so that'll finish up our eight foot tall fence. Hold of them so they don't slide down the wire and get away from you. Go about three fingers in, place your thumb, bend it at a 45. When you bend that wire to 40, roughly a 45 degree, and let your wires run parallel here so that your crimp sleeves are easier to slide on. All right, what I'm doing, I'm putting one staple flat against the post. Taking another staple, pounding in to hold it. What that'll do, that'll act as a roller system to let the wire pull against and tighten around the post without digging into the wood. I'll put one staple loosely over the wire to hold it up into position. Yeah, anytime you're going around a corner like that, if you do that, it allows it to roll right against it. We've chosen to use a quick end strainer for 12 and a half gauge wire. So essentially, you just plug the high tensile fence in on one side, and it can't pull out the other, pull back out. And then he's going to attach the opposite end into the ratchet. Strainer handle, 